Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 4.0 weekly live Q&A, as you guys will notice. Um, no Zach this week. He's on vacation. Um, it's just me. I have the pleasure of having um, the author of Industry 4.0, the, 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 actually the first Industry 4.0 book I ever read, um, Alistair Gilchrist, who's joined us today. Appreciate him joining us from um, Thailand. <laughs> so he's it's one o'clock in the morning for him. And yet he, he was kind enough to get up in the middle of the night and, and join the community. So I think you guys are really going to, um, enjoy what we're, what we're doing today. Uh, the, hopefully you guys will enjoy this conversation. Um, uh, cause I know I will. Um, all right, real quick, let me, you know, all of our, uh, housekeeping stuff. Uh, this week's live Q and a is sponsored by, uh, Digital Factory Mastermind. So those of you guys who are in the Mastermind program, we sh I think we're on week four of the Accelerator program. So all of those who joined Mastermind, um, you know, a year after we started, uh, Zach has been um, hosting a one-hour session every Wednesday. I'll be doing the session this week, which is on MES. Um, it started on February 2nd. We're covering the first 12 modules of the Mastermind program in 12 weeks. We've gotten great feedback. In fact, People who have been in the program for at least even people who have been in the program since the very beginning have said that it's been incredibly valuable um, to them because it basically is forcing them to do the work. So, a uh, so couple of news and up news and updates. I want to fly through this because the the conversation with Alistair I think is going to be the 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 biggest value for everyone today. Um, we have a bonus mastermind session this Friday. So you guys will remember we did the High Byte Intelligence Hub in February's. Um, uh, mastermind session, monthly mastermind session. Dave Schultz is going to be doing a more granular use case with High Byte this Friday. You guys should all be receiving an email um, on that session. Um, and this was uh, direct feedback that came um, from the uh, the advisory board. So uh, those of you who are in mastermind, again, we'll be doing a bonus session this Friday, which is Dave is going to be doing a deep dive um, on a High Byte use case. Um, using the intelligence hub to create models and flows to stream data into a unified namespace. Um, and then last week uh, we had mentorship two weeks ago, wasn't last week doing self-aware graphics, um, industry updates. For those of you who use the Canary labs historian, make sure you download version 21.5. I just upgraded all of our stuff. Um, there's a bunch of great additional features. All right. With that, let me go to, um, and introduce you guys to Alistair Gilchrist. Do you guys have any questions? Hey, Jeff Rankin, in how you doing from Penn College? Uh, hopefully, the your students enjoy this. Um, all right, with that, let me um, introduce you guys to Alistair. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, Alistair Gilchrist is uh, he is a prolific author on all things Industry 4.0, IIoT. Um, um, data governance, you know, uh, protocols, you name it. Uh, I mean, Alistair, I think you've written 40, 50 books, right? And you're currently working on one, you're researching a book, right, on Industry 5.0 now. Um, I was first introduced to you in 2017. Your book, Industry 4.0, um, was the, uh, the first Industry 4.0 book I actually read. Industry 4.0, The Industrial Internet of Things. You guys can get it on Amazon. I highly, highly recommend you read the book. Alistair and I were talking right before this session that when I was reading that book the first time, I probably agreed with, say, 80 to 90% of what was in there. Even to this day, I still agree with 80 to 90%. There's only a couple of small, minor um, places where we disagree. Um, but there are two other books that I want to recommend that you guys check out and you can get them. You can get also those on Amazon as well. So I've read three of Alistair's books, um, Industry 4.0, The Industrial Internet of Things. I've read Digital Success and I've read Supply Chain 4.0. Um, Digital Success is all about uh, avoiding the pitfalls and the approach that you need to take in order to successfully digitally transform an organization. He talks a lot about the holistic report, uh, approach required um, to successfully digitally transform. For those of you, for our clients that are 
um, watching a, a lot of what is in that book is stuff that you've heard during our digital transformation maturity assessment process. Um, for those, the students of ours, you've heard a lot of this. It's the holistic approach. Um, you know, think um, common digital strategy extended out to the whole organization. Alistair does a great job in that book talking about all of the the legs, the layers um, that make up that holistic approach. And then the last one is Supply Chain 4.0. Very interesting book. I truly enjoyed it. Um, I haven't read any of them in a couple of years, but I did touch on them for this interview. So um, that's Alasdair as I know him. I'm gonna I'm gonna let him introduce himself um, to the community. So and before we get into um, our conversation today, so Alasdair, thank you for joining us. Um, appreciate you getting up at one o'clock in the morning, man. Um, <laughs> The um, wh why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background, who you are? That's right. I'm yeah. very pleased to be here. Um, yeah, I've like you say, I've been a technical author for the last sort of decade. Before that, I was a uh, an IT director and say uh, in manufacturing and industry, and uh, prior to that, I was heavily involved in networking. Uh, basically, you know, sort of IP, Cisco, networking, and that was in the Middle East. So I was in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Qatar for like 10, 15 years. And before that was with Halliburton in manufacturing in Scotland. And uh, that's kind of where my technical industry experience has come from. Uh, it started off way back in 82 with IBM PC, the original one. So that's how long I've been in the industry. So I've absorbed a lot of the uh, knowledge on the way, most of which is redundant now, of course, but it's showing you the experience of, especially with digital transformation, it is, it's not, it appears to be something new, but it's really just the culmination of what we've learned over, you know, decades. And uh, so when you think about it like that, it, it makes a lot more sense when you realize it is really people and uh, processes that need to be addressed rather than the technologies itself. But uh, now I'm really spending most of my time writing here in Thailand. And uh, like you said, the new one is about Industry 5.0. Whether that's actually needed or not, I'm not sure yet. I'm still uh, trying to get my head around what it's actually trying to achieve. So why do you write so much? I mean, you you clearly, like if you look, if you go on Amazon, for those of you guys that are watching, if you go on Amazon and and, and look up Alistair, um, you know, there's 40, yeah. 50, 40, 50 books there. You're a prolific author. What What's the reason you write so much? What? How did you get there? How did you go from... IT professional manager in manufacturing to writing? Uh, well, writing was, was always kind of part of it because uh, we started up our own consultancy here in Thailand uh, just for 2010. And w when you start that, you, you, you suddenly get all these new fashionable uh, technologies and methodologies springing up and you have to research them and learn them because people just expect consultants to know everything and this is the, the way i found the quickest and easiest way to learn was to research things and uh, write it down and then you know sort of years of doing this meant that it was easy to then evolve that into writing actual books themselves because a lot of times it, it's actually a good way not just a good way of learning it's a good way of presenting it because you're actually learning as you go along so the reader's kind of learning with you hmm. rather than these huge leaps of a uh, knowledge that can leave you behind because when i was learning about uh, wireless uh, for actual networking it used to infuriate me that the first two two chapters or three chapters in a book would be fine you could read along with it 
And then the fourth one would be the sudden leap into hieroglyphics and you know really complicated maths and stuff like this that just basically left you stranded. So I've always tried to, to write the books so that you're learning along with me as I research these chapters and learn more about it. It, it hopefully is presented in a sort of linear sort of approach rather than sudden just leaps of knowledge. Is Industry 4.0, uh, the Industrial Internet of Things, is that your best-selling book of all the all the stuff you've written? Uh, no, it's it's probably the second one. The, the biggest selling one was SSL TLS for okay. some strange reason, but it's always sold well and still selling well. And it was one of my first books, but um, it, it seems to be a very popular subject for some strange reason, or maybe it's only because there's only a couple of books written about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of you it, have the market cornered there, right? Um, yeah, but Industry 4.0 was an interesting one because it was started off as Industry 4.0, but uh, when I tried to get it published with our press, um, they, they refused it. And they refused it because they said, nope, that's Industry 4.0, it's German-centric, it's European, we want it as the industrial internet of things. It's, fun that's that's it's funny. It, it's funny you say that. So I, I want a quick segue here. So I, you know, I see people try to do this, right? What is industry 4.0? All that means is it's the fourth industrial revolution, right? And, and that is very much a human enterprise. It is, it, it is not it, the, a person doesn't get to define what the fourth industrial revolution is. Like we, I can tell you what the fifth industrial revolution is. Okay. We, it's the natural progression of industrialization, right? I mean, my undergraduate work is all in sociology. We know exactly what the fifth industrial revolution is. Okay. We already know what it's going to be on top of the fourth industrial revolution on top of the, so let's define what they are. First industrial revolution was think printing press or industry for industry 0.0, .0 is printing press. Without the printing press, none of this is possible, right? In first industrial revolution, think steam engine. Second industrial revolution, think assembly line. Third industrial revolution is the automation of industrial processes. Think of it that way. And the fourth industrial revolution is the automation of business processes. Now it's using the data from all over your organization, putting it together to create information so that we can automate business processes. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means automating the decision-making process that we go through to decide which raw materials to run on which work orders, uh, how do I schedule, uh, which raw material vendor should I use, um, the um, uh, who should be, uh, which work orders should run on which shifts, um, which facilities should fulfill which orders. It's, it's all the thing. Think of all the things that people do between the concrete and carpeted side of the business. That's the fourth industrial revolution. It's collecting all that data and information and, and helping starting to automate those processes, right? The fifth industrial revolution is the natural evolution of that. And it's the ability of people to be in places they are physically are not. Okay. That is what the fifth industrial revolution will be. It will be the fact that I'll be able to use people here in the United States to literally virtually run manufacturing facilities on the other side of the globe. And the fifth industrial revolution is all about the metaverse, right? It is all about the metaverse, augmented reality, virtual reality. That will be the fifth industrial revolution, right? That is the natural progression. But one of the things that I see is people try to hijack what that is, right? Someone, someone wants to say, you know, I own the term industry 5.0. No, you don't. Humanity owns that. It's a natural progression of industrialization. If you industrialize on any planet, it's going to it's gonna go zero, one, two, three, four, five, and the exact same things are going to happen in the exact same order, right? Um, that's, it's a human endeavor. It's a human enterprise. I, and I, and I, I often laugh. People try to make these, these concepts m far more difficult than they actually are for the layperson. You touch on a really good point, which was the when you were talking about the Wi-Fi networks and stuff. 
about how the books always start out really readable in the beginning, right? And then all of a sudden now it's 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 uh it's Chinese to us. It's it's you know, I'm we're talking theory and mathematical formulas and the layperson can't understand that. Part of our mission here had been to democratize what it is Industry 4.0 is. What is the value of Industry 4.0 across all people? If I if I'm the receptionist, how does my job change from when I work for a traditional manufacturer to when I'm working for an Industry 4.0 manufacturer? If I am a controls engineer, how does my role change? How does it impact me? How can I provide value for my organization using you know, within the paradigm of the fourth industrial revolution. But even today you have, you know, people trying to hijack terms. The Germans didn't come up in industry 4.0. They may have coined the term, but the fourth industrial revolution is a human enterprise. And I think it's funny that your, your publisher even attributed industry 4.0 to the Germans simply because they're the ones who announced it at, you know, whatever show that was uh, Hanover Messi, right? At, in 2011 mm. or 12, but go ahead. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, what ahead. I would say in response to that, though, is that we can't just uh, wipe away the history of Industry 4.0. I mean, Industry 4.0 was a definite policy vision regarding manufacturing for the European Union. It was authored by the European Union. It is a physical uh, thing. We can't wipe away its history just like that. And Industry 4.0 is European centric. It was built really to improve industry across the whole of the European Union. And it grew from not just Germany's uh, Industry 4.0, there was the UK's catapults, there was France's uh, Freedom Industries or you know, Future Industries. And these all contributed to the European Union's Industry 4.0 initiative. And so it is a physical entity. And at the time, and this is what the publisher was annoyed about, was that in America, the, the initiative was the Industrial Internet of Things. And it was an association of all the, the big vendors, customers, businesses. And it was really important because it was like, what a lot of what you guys are doing, it was more the how. How do you connect routers to Internet of Things devices and industry? And because they, they gave you roadmaps and blueprint prints and test beds and everything, and it was really far more advanced than Industry 4.0, which was the Europeans' vision, but it was a, mainly a concept. It was very conceptual and very narrow to start with. It was about smart factories and smart products and how you would do this, why you would do it to get mask customization. But there was nothing about how you did it. it you were just left to think, well, you know, yeah, that, that's good ideas, but we couldn't really do that. But let me, I, let me, I want to say something real quick. Uh, I, I don't mean mm -hmm. to cut you off here. So Michael Rada, Michael Rada. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he Michael Rada says that he invented he's the he's the originator of Industry 5.0. Right. Um, and that he says, you know, dear Walker, you're wrong because Industry 5.0 intellectual property goes to me because you probably will not be speaking about Industry 5.0 today. There are six years of work behind. OK. Michael, with all due respect, you don't own Industry 5.0 any more than the Germans own Industry 4.0. OK, and that's it's just very it, you may want to own Industry 5.0 as much as you can, but you don't. OK, like it, here, just because the Germans say just because the Germans use the term Industry 4.0 doesn't mean that they own what the fourth industrial revolution actually becomes. And you make a really good point, Alistair, about it's a concept. What is the fourth industrial revolution and what is the value to humanity? And the answer is more efficient products, products that get better, um, um, safer products, um, mm. you know, for consumers, right? That's the fourth industrial revolution is all about in practice, automating business processes 
Okay. It, business processes, all about automating business processes for, um, um, f- to that end for efficiency, yeah. productivity. I agree with that, but the thing is we have to dis- differentiate between two different terms here. The fourth industrial revolution is one thing, and you're quite right. That's exactly what it all entails. But industry 4.0 is something completely different. It is. It, it, isn't. it, it was meant to be. Vision. It, it was they're meant to be. It was, they're not synonymous. It, they are, though. Because they're synonymous in practice, that's what matters. Just because, just because the Germans. This is my point. My point was was what I observed among the community was, um, the when you went into if I go into any manufacturer and I say, go into any boardroom, I say, tell me what Industry 4.0 is. Tell me what it is. They are not going to say, Industry 4.0 is a concept driven by the Germans to improve industry and that was announced at Hanover Massey, uh, Massey in 2011. I think it was 2011, right? They're not going to say that. And, and if I go and I poll, if I go and I poll the C-suite in North America, in the EU, all over the globe, I'm not going to get that answer. I might get that answer from a select group of people, but the consensus will not be that Industry 4.0 is a German thing. That won't be the consensus. It'll be well, that it was a it was a thing that originated with a German concept that grew into something entirely different. Well, it certainly originated from the German concept. And like I said, it was developed and expanded by the European Union in 2015, 2016 into a very detailed vision. And that has been published and is well accepted a uh, if you want to deny it, it it seems pretty illogical because it exists. And, you know, we can't just misappropriate terms because this it leads me to the thing about uh, why so many initiatives and projects, whether it be Industry 4.0 or whether it be digital transformation, go wrong, is that they're so poorly understood because people keep changing what the definitions are. Now, Industry 4.0, the European Union themselves say, is very poorly defined. And that wouldn't surprise me if you went to a poll and you got asked 100 people, I think you would get probably 99 different answers. And one of them would be no idea at all. But because it is so poorly defined, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Industry 4.0 is an entity, it is a specific uh, published document, and we can't really just brush it under the table and just use its title in, as a cinnamon for the fourth, fourth Industrial Revolution, because that's the really the way it became so that was, popular. What, was because what, I would, of- what I would argue is that that's hogwash, and that you can, and that it was the Germans' mistake for trying to hijack the term, but it's not, it isn't my fault or the community's fault. Okay. The, the, it, it's not my fault or the community's fault that the Germans are terrible at innovation, that, that they are not good at innovation. They're good at perfection, but they're not good at innovation. There's a reason that Tesla and Amazon who are ranked number one and number two across our scoring mechanism. So if you take our 10 point mechanism and we and you you score an uh, in industrial company in industrialized organization and Tesla is numero uno the highest scoring organization on the planet and Amazon's number two it's it's no coincidence that both of those companies are based on the west coast of the United States it's not a coincidence that both of those organizations are the two most um, integrated, seamlessly integrated organizations on the planet and the gold standard for how you become an industry 4.0 company. Now, if we can, we can debate the semantics, right? We can debate this. Now, I'll say this. Volkswagen is the only legacy manufacturer on the planet who's in the top 10. So there's about 1,300 companies in our data set. 
Volkswagen is the only legacy organization in the top 10, and they're a German organization. Okay. But our scoring of Volkswagen is based on their operations here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think when people say, Hey, when you say, when you say industry 4.0, when you say industry 4.0, people don't think German document, they think fourth industrial revolution. And I didn't create that. Walker didn't do that. That it was a, it was, it, it was a natural perception, which extended from the third industrial revolution. Go ahead, Alistair, comment on that, please. See, you're going back to conflating the fourth industrial revolution with industry 4.0. They're not the same things. You can't compare them. Let's define the difference. Go ahead and define the difference between the two. Well, industry 4.0 is a product of the European Union's vision in 2015 for improving manufacturing in Europe. It is a policy decision. It's an actual document that covers a all the scope from supply chain through to customer and mass customization. It was a detailed, a not a directive. It wasn't a recommendation of either. It was just a recommended roadmap of how you would go from being an industry 3.0 a manufacturer to being a manufacturer of the future. And why hasn't it worked? From your opinion, Sorry? one of the things that I love about in your book, you talk about, I, and I don't remember if this is in, in digital success or if it's in the industrial internet of things book, industry 4.0 and the industrial internet of things. By the way, I just want to point something out. Even your own book is industry 4.0 colon the industrial internet of things. And the, con the, I don't want to say the conflation because it's not the conflation. You do delineate in the book. Yeah. You, well, you well, do define. Yep. So go ahead. Before okay. is that the publisher, it was industry 4.0 and they wanted it changed to industrial internet of things because they said industry 4.0 won't sell in the United States. Now, Springer, who actually were the real publishers, came back and said, Right, we want the book, but you've got to change the title, change it back to Industry 4.0, because it's the better known name. And it's a better known name, even though the Industrial Internet of Things was a much bigger and more successful organisation, uh, Industry 4.0 became more popular because of basically once the the names, the, the technology started getting into the mainstream media, journalists started using Industry 4.0 rather than the more clumsy industrial internet of things. Yeah, but journalists Simply journalists don't journalists don't here I, I wanna I wanna drive this point home for you, Michael Rada. You, Michael Rada, and and the and I don't want to call you guys the establishment, but the establishment, not you guys. Okay. So let me let me say this. No one gives a shit who'd coined the term. Like people who solve the problems don't give a shit whether that's a standard written in Germany, whether Society 5.0 was written in Japan. The only people who care about those things are the people who want to who want to hitch their wagon to the association who coined that term. But where the rubber meets the road, that is the actual manufacturers who are tasked with remaining competitive in a global market. They they don't care who coined the term. I'm not coming down on you here. This is more on Michael Rada here. So I I and I do want to interview Michael because he has some really interesting things here. But let me say this. I don't need to know, me personally, I don't need to know what the German's goal for Industry 4.0 was because I don't I don't believe the Germans are going to lead in manufacturing globally a decade from now in any way shape or form. Just I, I, they won't. That is that manufacturing is going to be led by the United States. One hundred percent. It's already too late. No one else is going to be able to catch up. Um, the it is. And mark my words, you can record <laughs> this. You can record this and you'll be able to play it over and over and over again. The ship has already sailed. The ship has already sailed. The organizations who have mastered digital transformation. Tesla, 
Amazon, like we're going to talk about Tesla here in a second. I want to go through some of your comments on our videos and kind of give you a chance to expand on what you mean. Because one of the things I want the community here to know is, you know, we don't get a lot. I don't get a lot of criticism. I don't get a lot of people who go on our videos and go, oh, Walker, you have no idea what you're talking about. I don't get that very often. Um, but I welcome it. I honestly do, because I know I can defend my positions with results. I can say, here, here was what somebody put in a book for me. Here's what I faced when I went to the plant floor. Here's how I had to reconcile the two, right? I can say that. I, I'm able to say, here are those challenges that you face. Here's how you reconcile them. So I know that I can defend the strategies, the architecture, right? The philosophies that we encourage people to use to solve their digital problems, okay? Or to solve their problems with digital solutions. I want, but I want to get to this, this Tesla component because one of the comments that you had made in one of the videos was, how can you call Tesla an industry 4.0 company if they have problem X, Y, and Z? Now, I understand now the where you and I disagree is on the term industry 4.0. So I think for the community, for the community, I will grant to you industry 4.0 originates in Germany. It is a standard. And it was announced at Hanover Messe in 2011. But because the Germans are so terrible at innovation, that's why, and the Germans are terrible at innovation. And it's not because they're German. It's because the way the economy is constructed. Innovation is not rewarded. Innovation is rewarded in the United States because the only way you stay in business is by producing. That, that is the same cannot be said for manufacturers in Germany. You can, you can be bad at manufacturing. You can run a loss and still stay in business because manufacturing is subsidized by the federal government in Germany. It's a completely different economic model. So they, don't, they didn't have to realize the value. The government has to realize the value, but private enterprise doesn't. In the United States, we had private enterprise has to realize the value of the fourth industrial revolution, okay? You and I disagree on that term, and I will grant you that perhaps I misuse the term from time to time, but I'm not gonna stop doing that because industry 4.0 will long-term is not going to be defined as what the Germans said it was in 2011. It's going to be defined based on the results that extended from it. Please go ahead and comment. Right, well, I don't know why you keep going on about the Germans. Right? Yes, I've told you it's the product of the European Union, the European led, government. Led, led by and the Germans. Yes, they subsidized it, not led by Germany at all. And yes, they subsidized it. And this was the problem with Industry 4.0, is it was institutionalized. It was part, it was produced by the government and it was funded by the government. They, they put in something like in 2015, they put in like 80 billion to support it. And so industry was being subsidized and each individual country was still putting in the, their own funds, like the UK put in like 100 million or something. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, industry was subsidized. You're, you're right about that. Um, but I, I don't think it is a lack of innovation. I don't think there's, and certainly not lack of manufacturing excellence. Volkswagen, a uh, Daimler, BMW, they're all highly successful and have been, and their, their manufacturing is, you know, first class. Mm -hmm. I de definitely give it to you on Volkswagen for sure. I, I, mm -hmm. I praise Volkswagen a lot, especially their U S operations. I've never, seen their operations in Germany, but I definitely, I'll give it to you on Volkswagen for sure. Yeah, I suck for their, yeah, I mean, the problem with when you're looking at a comparing Tesla with Volkswagen is, is it's a very strange comparison because Volkswagen is, is massive. They're massively bigger than Tesla. The, the problem is that Tesla has is got a very, well, it's not a problem, but it's a good problem to have, is this hugely overinflated share price, which makes it look like a I think hugely they're... successful company when there's nothing to, really backing up that share price. It no. is a tremendous. 
this work by Elon Musk. To somehow- this is this is funny. It's <laughs> funny you used to say this. You commented on one of our videos, the Industry 4.0 Mindset. The Industry 4.0 Mindset. I talked, mm-hmm. you commented on, on that video, okay? And you said that this is absolute nonsense. Your comment was, this is absolute nonsense. This has nothing to do with Industry 4.0. And I, I highlighted in that video that Industry 4.0 professionals are values-driven, right? I, I listed off a whole, they're change agents. They recognize they're not going to be popular, all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that I talked about in there was defining success, understanding that the definition of success in Industry 4.0 is not the same as it has been. And you, we talk about, you were saying, the share price is, is highly uh, overvalued. I agree with you, it is overvalued, but not significantly. And here's why, here's why, here's why. Tesla has been incredibly successful because Elon Musk has achieved what his goal was. He's achieved his goal. Something that General Motors, Ford, Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes, if they're so great at manufacturing, right? And, and, and I, I, I don't disagree with you that, that these manufacturers can't, they don't, when we define manufacturing as taking raw materials in the back door and sending finished goods out the front door with the highest level of quality, right? If that's our definition, they're really good at that. But there's something they're not good at. They're actually terrible at, Okay. And that is responding to what customers really want. Okay. Tesla, you, you, you commented, um, you know, when we talked about defining success, Tesla defines success as increasing the longevity of the human species on earth. Okay. T- Elon Musk, Elon Musk single-handedly through industry, through innovation, and through a commitment to his strategy has forced the hand of companies whose market cap come to almost a trillion dollars globally. He has forced them, forced them to change the way they manufacture, to change the products that they build, and to change the way those pr- they treat those products after they ship them to the customer. That is his definition of success. And so the investor in Tesla is saying, if he, if this guy, if the guy running that company was able to force the hand of BMW, Daimler, Chrysler, Volkswagen, Ford, GM, you name it. If he was able to force their hand, he can do anything. And Warren Buffett says that you follow organizations that do two things. They have great leadership and they can execute. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. So I don't think, I think if if you're investing in Tesla, you're doing the right thing. Because yeah, well, Warren Buffett would, uh, Buffett would, would certainly disagree with you in that because he says he would not invest in Tesla and he, nobody would invest in Tesla with that vastly overpriced uh, shares. Mm-hmm. And that just shows you that the stock exchange is basically gambling. It's, it's got very little uh, relevance to modern economics. We, we, if you look Does at... It? Warren Buffett would actually look at the fundamentals of a company. He would look at the assets, the order books, whatever. And Tesla just doesn't add up. And no economist will actually agree with you that the share price is vastly overheated. It's, it is. It is overheated. I I disagree though because of my age mainly. You know, I have I have a lot of runway left. I mm-hmm. for me. I that I agree it's overinflated but the people who argue that it's you know it's it's 3x or 4x where it should be are it's ho- it's absolute hogwash it because uh, we all recognize and I, I this is the question I ask people I ask this question how do you explain Tesla's growth te- we use Tesla and Amazon how do you explain Tesla's ability in a 5 year window or 4 year window from 2018, when, when Toyota abandoned the partnership, to 2022, where they're the most, you know, one, two valuable company in the planet. Um, how do you explain that exponential increase in efficiency, and that, that exponential improvement? How do you explain that? It's not brand building. I've bought two Teslas in the last four months, okay? I didn't own a Tesla before four months ago, but I talked about Tesla all the time. I worked on the Model S line in 2013. I've been 
part of the Tesla ecosystem for a long time. But I bought my first Tesla four months ago. I bought a Model 3 Performance like in October. And then I ordered a Model S, but I was going to have to wait too long for it to come. I've driven two of these cars. And let me say this. When my kids get in the car, I ask my children because they're the future. I said, did I overpay for this? I spent $80,000 in the Model 3 Performance. I spent over $100,000 in the Model S. And when I tell my kids how much I spent on those cars and they get in them and we drive and I ask them, did I waste my money? They say, hell fucking no, you did not. And I ask them why. Why is it that you believe this car is worth $100,000? My, my 23-year-old son, my 18-year-old son, right? These aren't children. Why? And they say, it's like driving my smartphone. That was their response. So you had talked about in the video, you said, how can Tesla be considered an industry 4.0 company with its poor quality and its willingness to provide customers with substandard goods that's not industry 4.0, even by your strange definition? Now, I will concede, yeah, okay. I will concede that you and I are using different definitions for industry 4.0. You're, you're using the standard definition, and I'm using the fourth mm -hmm. industrial revolution definition. Even with that point, though, the question that I would return to you is this. The question we really should be asking is, why is it Tesla consumers don't care about those quality issues? Why are they still spending that kind of money? I, frankly, I, I'm quite amazed that they do. But there's, there's some amazing things about Tesla. Uh, I agree with you. It's an outstanding company. Uh, my issue with the share price is more about envy that I didn't buy them earlier. But... Uh, <laughs> That they still are overvalued. I agree. And I can't get away from that. But even the, the way Elon Musk does things is, is so controversial and so strange. Like, you know, he puts out a video showing him sweeping under his desk at the factory and uh, working on the production line. You know, no CEO in their right mind would do this. You can't imagine CEO of BMW doing this because it sends out. A really dangerous signal it sounds like that you know maybe the company's in trouble and yeah it doesn't seem to matter the share price goes up <laughs> have you ever have you ever um yeah because we aren't buying a car for their body panel gaps being perfect that's exactly it brian privy this is i can't convey this enough i cannot convey this enough to people you know it, you know, it's the old adage that that uh, Henry Ford said. He said that if we had trusted the customer or the cu trusted the customer, um, if we were going to build what the customer wanted in 1900, we would have built them a faster horse carriage. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For for General Motors, Daimler, Chrysler, BMW, Mercedes, they're they're in theory, they are the best of the best in manufacturing. And I and I concede that there are amazing engineers there and they've done some amazing things. Why didn't they create the Tesla? What's the reason? What's the reason? Even today, I, I work with man, auto manufacturers. Right now, they're our customer. I have clients for the largest auto manufacturers on the planet watching this video right now. And I tell them all the time, you guys are in fucking trouble. You're in trouble. You have no idea. But President Biden praised Ford and General Motors as leading the electric vehicle race here in the United States, mark my words, Ford and General Motors are dead, dead men walking. Why is it the Ford F-150 Lightning hasn't sold, even though by all accounts, by all accounts, it's this phenomenal vehicle? What's the reason? And the answer is, is they're missing the most important part. It's not that it's an electric vehicle. It's that it's a product that gets better after you buy it. And I don't understand why people don't listen. It's, you know, you were talking about the build quality, right? And this is really important yeah. for manufacturers. I have three phones here, right? I have an iPhone 13. I have a Pine Phone Manjaro, okay? And I have a Xiaomi Realme XT. Got these three phones. The build quality on all three of these phones are exceptional, okay? This one, the Realme XT, because it's a Xiaomi, it's a Chinese manufacturer, you really can't yeah. use it here in the United States. But it's an exceptional phone. The problem is, is the software, the ecosystem that runs on it, Android 11, is not integrated enough for my daily life, for this to be my daily driver. 
The Pine Phone, the software is just not mature enough, doesn't improve fast enough for me to use this at all. And the iPhone 13 has the most seamless experience with my life, what it, in, including the fact that I can add drivers to my Tesla, I can start my car, I can retrieve my car, I can summon my car to the front door out here, I can look at, I can analyze my, my energy consumption all through this ecosystem. Manufacturers are missing the point. Okay, why do I buy, why is it I buy from Amazon, I order from Amazon and I don't order from walmart.com, even though Walmart will deliver to me in 48 hours? And the answer is the experience, the additional value I get from using the Amazon app, the analysis features, the way that I can look up previous orders seamlessly and reorder, the experience, the value of being an Amazon customer is gets better over time. The, the products that I buy, this iPhone gets better with every update, even though it's the same hardware. The point is, I never look at the build quality. No one cares about that. Car and driver may have cared. That may have been their standard. Uh, Akito Toyota may have made that type of quality really important post-World War II, but the consumer doesn't give a shit. Yet everyone keeps pointing out, well, their build quality. And I keep saying, why does it even matter? Because when I drive 155 miles an hour on 635 Express in North Dallas, the car doesn't rattle. You know what I mean? That's that's my point. Is And, and, and I'd love for you to, to answer that because I think you are uniquely positioned to answer this question. How is it that what the cost, the companies that get digital transformation right versus the companies that get digital transformation wrong, what are the companies doing right in order to succeed? What, in your estimation, uh, what you've observed over the last five, seven years, the companies that are doing it right, what are they doing different? Well, what digital transformation? Uh... It's really the de democratization of uh, information. They're sharing information throughout the different departments on a holistic scale, you know, right the way through. And they're giving people information in the format they need it and um, sharing it easily between departments. So logistics and sales and finance are all using data from a single source of truth. Now, that means just one integrated data center uh, or database, depending on the size of your company. And uh, that's really the, the foundation of it. Everybody uses the, the same data because what was happening before, and is still the bugbear of most companies, is that each department, and this is the line managers uh, doing it, use their own spreadsheets and they come to meetings with their own version of the truth and they all believe in it but of course they're all different and nobody can get a consensus as to what is the, the current status of the business so you can't make proper forecasts whereas i think you said one of your videos that you know with digital transformation, you are able to now make good forecasts because you've got all your past data, all your present data, and now you can, with good percentage of uh, confidence, forecast the future. And it, that's hugely important, and that's what is making things different. Now, if you're able to forecast the future, you can also, as you're saying there, make products better after after sales if you can do use software and this is the problem is that people you can't do it really with hardware unless you do hardware recalls which is very cost uh, costly but with software it, it but this is not something new i mean windows and virus protections have been doing this for decades you know updating their products over the air at night and you wake up in the morning and you've got you know new drivers installed better updates for viruses and that so updating software and continuous uh, delivery 
to continuous deployment is it, nothing new. It's not, not something uh, unique to Tesla. And this is why I think we've got to be careful about shining, you know, the, the torch holding up a uh, Tesla is a great advantage of updating software. I mean, software companies have been doing this for decades. It's not it's not so much the software. You're you're correct there. It's not so much the software. It's the experience. It's the what they do is maybe they just do software updates better. And 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 they get they get yeah, I mean, um you know, have you ever driven in a have you ever driven a Tesla? No, I've never even seen a Tesla. <laughs> I would love to there's lots of electric cars here, but they're all I, high end Mercedes, BMW, stuff like that. I've never seen a Tesla. I would have thought you would be because the the Beijing factory's up and running, isn't it? Yeah. I yeah, so I would the, love to have you come here. Tesla. I'd love to yeah. I'd love to fly you here and film your first ride in a Tesla. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let, let me. I want to show you, Zach. Uh, uh, Josh, go ahead and show my shared screen. I want to show you something else there, real quick, um, and then kind of let you take us home. Um, everything that we do in our content, and and you and I didn't really get a chance to like do a lot of background stuff, but everything that we do in our content, whether that's on YouTube, which is our generic content, it's the ten thousand foot view, it's the five thousand foot view. You know, it's where I'll conflate terms like Industry 4.0 and Fourth Industrial Revolution, right? Um, it is it is meant to take complex concepts and make them digestible for um, um, the layperson, all the a, a broad audience. And then at IoT.University in our Discord channel, that's where we talk about the technical details. But the goal is all about getting people to the same architecture, a common strategy. Um, and using the right partners so that ultimately they're going to be able to plug into the, 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 the supply chain 4.0, right? The, 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 the digital supply chain. This is an example here of all over the world right now. There are, we have, it looks like I've got five people all over the world who are publishing their namespaces. You asked the question about what's the difference between a namespace and a unified namespace and why does it matter, right? Yeah. Right. And and I wanted to answer this question for you. So we're ultimately trying to get people to do this for scalability, right? You know, you, you, might, you make a really good point in your digital success book about one of the biggest challenges that organizations face in digital transformation is being able to adjust, right? to adjust the ne changing needs and wants. And, um, you know, the, the time to value needs to be short, right? Your strategy needs to be in such that you're, you're providing value during this journey quickly, right? You bring up a lot of points about that in the, in that book and this, the unified namespace, the technical approach we take to solving problems is all about that. Okay. So right now, all over the world, we have five different people who are all publishing their data to a common infrastructure that's available to anyone who can subscribe to it. So, you know, we have multiple facilities right now. And I'm not, I didn't do any of those. There's no integration done here whatsoever. The work was done at the plant and the plant transmits everything to us so that I can then access it, right? So whether I'm looking at the MES layer, whether I'm looking at the ERP, layer. These, this demo facility is in one location. This is, I don't know who this is, DM. This is somebody else who's transmitting their data, somebody named Eaton. Uh, there we have a PLC next behind me. The point is, is that the, in order for organizations to successfully digitally transform, they got to do three things right. They have to pick the right technology. Okay. That is the underlying technology they use to be the the hub of their infrastructure has got to be right, okay? Um, and right means lightweight, report by exception, edge driven. Number two, they have to have the right strategy, digital strategy, right? And, you know, this, this is why Amazon kills everybody because the strategy in Amazon is we're going to make all data and information accessible to any consumer who wants it through services. Boom. Uh, answer Shrikant Jayaraman's, how is a unified namespace different from a data lake? A data lake is history. 
Okay. It's a data store. A unified namespace is only current state. There's no history in a unified namespace. It's it's the current state. It's the it's the structure of our enterprise. It's all the events as they stand right now. If you were ever if you were to snapshot a unified namespace, that would be exactly the, the state at that moment of the whole business. So that I could then compare an OEE calculation in one area to an OEE calculation in another, because I knew exactly what they were without me having to write a select statement where the timestamp was between these ranges, right? Um, so but every, yeah, go ahead, no Alex. persistence data at all then? Say that again? There's no persistence in the data. There's no, no, there, 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 no is per, there is persistence, but it's not in the unified namespace. It is in a consumer of the unified namespace. So you have a node that is responsible for the, the persistence, the history. But the unified namespace itself is just the structure and the events. Right. As as it stands right now. It's the it's the it's not transport, it's not data layer, it's transport data layer, structure and events all in one. So, yeah, so it's a basically a system integration of the different machine tools on the plant floor. Correct. It's it's a <laughs> it's an agno agnostic to... integration. Yeah, and that needs to integrate still with the ERP and the CRM to, to get this single source of truth. The ERP and the CRM produce and consume into the unified namespace as nodes. So you'll notice if we look at... Yep, here. Instead of, instead of using web services and microservices interfaces with ERP, ERP also publishes. publishes and consumes into a unified namespace. All right. Hey, uh, I know we're going to run out of time here. Uh, Josh, go ahead and stop my screen share. Yep. Alistair, I wanted to ask two fi final questions and give you a chance yeah. to take us home. So number one, how is your view of industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, the industrial internet of things, right? That, in that encompassing vision. How has it changed over the last five years? Like what, you know, what are one or two nuggets um well, that you could give to the community the, the problem with uh, industry 4.0 from as the european union standard is that it hasn't been the success it was hoped to be it's fallen well short if we it really depends on how you uh, quantify the, the success initially the eu set out that it wanted industry 4.0 to produce 20 percent of value add to gdp it's fallen way short of that it was at 15.3 in uh, 2015 and it's about one percent less i think now so it's got nowhere near the the 20 percent it shed a lot of jobs consultancies were well uh, versed in saying oh but there'll be net gains in employment to industry 4.0 and it will be higher better paid jobs more efficient jobs uh, but that that's not happened so these jobs have been created but not in manufacturing they've been placed in the vendors because it's the vendors who are doing the machine learning the ai all this stuff it's not the manufacturers and so any jobs are, you know, in the vendor's cloud somewhere or other. It's not on the, the plant floor. And so there's a lot more dis disillusionment now with uh, Industry 4.0. And this is why the EU are now trying to kickstart it with uh, Industry 5.0. But this is what I was saying. I'm researching that just now, but I'm not sure where that's going. Because I can't see how you can just reboot Industry 4.0 as Industry 5.0 with just a focus on people, the environment, and society. When the reason these were admitted was because nobody wanted these dimensions in the first place. Uh, people were happy to lose jobs uh, through mass automation. Well, not people, but the companies were, because it saved them a lot of money. Uh, and this is the uh, the thing. I'm not sure 
machine learning, for example, was supposed to be the savior. This was going to create jobs, but machine learning is hugely expensive and way outside the competency of almost all companies other than the huge ones, the Googles, the Amazons, these people. Uh, so the people use machine learning, but this is the thing, they don't develop it or generate their own. So they don't need the people. They just use an API to somebody to Google or something, or they use the vendors to generate the, the what's it called, predictive maintenance, which is the, the favorite one that they throw up. But the company can't do that. They can't strip down machines and work out how they work and what sensor does what, and then do the machine learning. They, they just go straight to the vendor. He's got all the data. It's easier for them to do the machine learning and then sell it as a service to the manufacturers. So these jobs are not being created in the plants. They're being created at the vendors. So even though... You just made no, the case. You just made growth, the case to manufacture yeah, Growth in uh, manufacturing, but it doesn't really necessarily mean it's not been successful because it's provided jobs and growth in other areas. It's just not being realized in manufacturing. I, I would, I, I agree with you that, part, especially I, I would agree with you as it relates to legacy manufacturers. Mm -hmm. okay, that is the, 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 the organizations that have been around forever. I agree with you. Um, we, we've known for some time, we've been saying for some time, the vast majority of manufacturers in the North America specifically, are either going to get acquired or go out of business in, you know, between now and 2032. We know that. One out of 12, you're going to make it. 11 out of 12 are going to get acquired or, get, or, or lose to a competitor because digital transformation is really, really hard. It's really difficult. That's why you see it. The realization of the digital, of digital manufacturing in startups because they don't have the albatross of success around their neck. The success we had over the last three decades doing it some other way. But even so, to this point, they don't even understand how their products need to change. They don't even understand how consumers don't, they expect products to get better after they buy them. Subconsciously, they expect it. And, and, and the fact that there are still people out there who don't understand why Tesla is as successful as they are, you, I could tell you this right now. You get in a Tesla, you go for a 10-minute drive, you come back, and you don't ask that question anymore. You don't. Well, no, I mean, that, that's very noticeable in uh, the videos you see online that nobody really has got a bad word to say about them for their drivability and their... Uh, their speed and performance. But the, the same problem keeps cropping up, although it's getting less now because I think they're beginning to resolve a lot of their quality issues. But a couple of years ago, or just even a year ago, the, there was cars being delivered with, you know, panels not meeting up properly, doors not opening or not closing. And th these things shouldn't be happening in a car uh, of that class. And it, it's really wonder that they didn't try to do anything about this sooner because it should have caused a lot of reputational damage. And that's one of the major areas of profitability is long-term profitability comes through reputation. And But Tesla's reputation doesn't seem to have been uh, damaged by it for some reason. I don't think anybody else would have survived that. You know, Volkswagen started putting out cars with doors that didn't open or close. Uh, they, they would have a hard job surviving it. I, I, I can say this. I've walked the plant floor at, at, in, at Giga. I have, um, there's another EV manufacturer I don't, I have an NDA with that I can't say, but I've walked their facility, actually two other ones. I've been inside of you know, traditional auto manufacturers many times. Ford was one of my customers when I worked as, as a tier one automotive supplier. And, and it, and to me, it just, it's stag, it boggles the mind to me that if you walk the, the plant floor and if you consume the product, to me, it is just so obvious that Tesla 
is so, is far superior to any other manufacturer on the planet and it's not even close like it's just so obvious and and it and it, it and it it and i and it, it it's hard for me to understand people who have seen gone through that same thing it's different for you right you haven't driven a tesla or been in a tesla facility or anything but there, i know lots of people who have who can't see it who they they're cuz their mindset's different they're still viewing the manufacturing and the and the delivery of products with without th- through a mindset they yeah. they don't they don't understand that everyone like when i bought i bought a lamp the other day right i bought a lamp the other day bought a new house a couple months or a month ago and i was buying lamps for my bedroom and i remember thinking why is it there's no lamp out there that allows me to integrate into my MQTT broker in my house that would tell me the number of times that light has gone on or off. Like, why is it that lamp's not available? It was the first thing I thought. I'm like, why is no one making a lamp that provides me value other than just light? Digital value other than just light. And 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 and, and I think the when more people start asking those questions, that's when we will see Industry 4.0 realize value for organizations in EU the way they had hoped. With that, I know we're a couple of minutes over. Did you have any any questions that you wanted to ask me? Any other ones? I know we touched on a bunch of stuff. Well, I had some questions about the uh, namespace, but it's okay. We're running over time, so no, I, I, I'm I'm happy to answer the questions. And if people drop off, they you know I'm I'm cool with that. I I I, I want to make sure that I I answer. You talked about machine learning, the unified namespace. Part of the mm-hmm. reason we created the unified namespace is to solve the integration problem for ML. One of the challenge you talked about how challenging machine learning is. It is. It's hard, right? Oh, it's well, hard <laughs> one of the biggest challenges in machine learning is the acquisition and normalization of data before you can ever even analyze it, before you can even model it, right? The unified namespace creates the common structure and the normalization of the data. And what I mean about normalization, if I want to if I want to compare, if I want to use a multi-variable machine learning algorithm. That is I want to look at things like I want to monitor my OEE calculation, I want to monitor the a specific temperature sensor and I want to want monitor machine count coming off of a machine. All three of those data points transition at different rates. If my OEE calculation happens every 60 seconds or every 120 seconds or every five minutes, my sensor could change up to 60 times per second. And my count could be whatever the standard rate of the machine is, right? 30 parts a minute. The first thing that I have to do, if I wanted to go retrieve that data from a database, if I want to go get it from a database, the first thing that I'm going to have to do is write some complex select statement to normalize that, group them all together, right? The the Mm -hmm. 12 transitions of OEE with the thousand transitions of the sensor, right? I got to group all that together. That's normalization. The unified namespace bakes that into the architecture. So I don't even have to worry about that anymore. All I have to do is take a snapshot of the namespace at said interval. That's all I got to do. Let's say I go, I want this ML, the resolution of my ML data needs to be 30 Hertz. So 30 times a second, I want to see a snapshot. And now, and all I do is pull that from the UNS. It's fully normalized, common structure. That was one of the reasons we moved to machine learning. And when we were working with an Irish company, or not an Irish company, a a global sugar water manufacturer, everybody knows their name. They're, you know, they have a facility, a bottling facility in Ireland. And they came to us because they've been trying to predict batch failures of their soda. Okay. They wanted to predict batch failures. And they were, and they had a data scientist, and they were going through this whole process trying to figure out why they couldn't get this machine learning algorithm to work. And the first thing we said when we looked at it was, "Well, your data is not normalized. That's the issue." And it wasn't that the data scientist got it wrong; it was that the engineers on the plant floor got it wrong. The data scientist didn't know that the data was normalized, and so therefore it was garbage data in, garbage results out. Mm-hmm. So the unified names provide solutions for that. It also gives you a single source of truth. For any consumer, the consumers we know about and the consumers that are going to come down the road don't know about. That's really what it is. And and it it was really designed to solve a major problem 
in digital transformation, which is how do we integrate so many disparate systems together without first having to know the ins and outs of every one of those disparate systems? I, I would need a subject matter expert in every system in order to be able to integrate all of them together using prevailing technology. And so what we did was we designed an approach, a strategy, and we adopted technology, specifically MQTT with Spark Plug B, to jump that hurdle. And it was a, we did that so that we could pass it on to the rest of the world. But that the unified namespace is the structure of the business and all the events, and it solves many problems. Yeah, it seems good. It looks a, a good approach. Awesome. I was quite Alice, intrigued by it. Uh, real quick, uh, Michael Rada, let me, I just want to make sure there aren't any open questions for you real quick. Walker, looking at the topic of the current discussion, which I do not understand, let me ask you how many data are not used and are wasted? What was the number before and what is it now? Um, so Michael Rada, good question. Um, so, and, and by when you say before and what is it now, I think I, I'm assuming what you're saying is, uh, before was pre- fourth industrial revolution and now is post fourth industrial revolution. The answer is, is that during the third industrial revolution, the only data you collected was the data you were going to specifically use. It was deterministic. That is, I'm only going to collect data I have a specific purpose for. One of the things that changed between industry 3.0 and industry 4.0 or third industrial revolution, fourth industrial revolution is all data matters in the fourth industrial revolution. Five of the 10 most valuable companies on the planet are in the business of just collecting data, and they may not even know what they're doing with it. But in order for you to realize the value, unlock the potential, you have to, you have to collect the data. Oh, before your implementation. So are you talking about our machine learning? How much data was not used and wasted? What number before? Um, okay, so I would say about half of the data that they were consuming was junk, trash. Um, I could look at the exact numbers. It's in the forties. I'm pretty sure. Um, and we have 99% data fidelity post implementation. So 99% is being used now. All right. Um, Alistair, any other questions? No, no, I'm fine. Hey brother, I, I listen, I, I really, really appreciate, um, you joining us here in the middle of the night. I'd love to have you back. Um, <laughs> I would love to have you back on and, and what I'd really like to do is go through one of your books. Like I, I would love to go through either su um, Supply Chain 4.0 or um, uh, Digital Success. I love, by the way, the Digital Success book. So for those of you guys who have, um, you know, who are joining, I highly, highly recommend that you pick up Industry 4.0, the Industrial Internet of Things. Digital Success in Supply Chain 4.0. They're all available on Amazon by Alasdair Gilchrist. Uh, I think even Alasdair would agree that there are some things in those books that he would probably change in later revisions. I don't oh, want to speak for you. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. definitely. But, things sure. but I, th I think they're great primers. I, 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 they're three of my favorite books in the, in the space. So That's great. Thank you. Awesome. Alasdair, appreciate you, brother. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you guys uh, next hey, thanks week. Thanks, Thanks, man. See ya. Cheers.